here today. It's a great day to worship the Lord and come together as the church. I'm glad that each of you are here today. I know the Lord's happy to see his people gather together. Let's uh, take our hymnals, please, if you would, and turn to number 16. Number 16. We're going to start this morning by singing out about the Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Would you please stand with me and we'll sing it together. Number 16. How many of you were confused by that? If your hand's not up, then you can read music. Guess whose hand is still up? <laughs> Sometimes the music guy, it'd be nice to be able to actually read music, right? Yeah. Anyhow, that was very good. Let's sing it again. Let's sing the second verse together. He chose us. Number 492. It can only get better from there. Amen. That was a blessing. I apologize for that. 492. Let's sing, Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Mercy there was great, grace was free. Let's all sing together. 492. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. It was for me he died Salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God. 
Praise the Lord for Calvary, and praise the Lord for seeing you here today. Thank you for coming and being with us at Truth Baptist Church. It is a blessing to be here, a blessing to be together. What beautiful weather outside, right? It's like the Lord gave us perfect weather. I was, I was looking, and I saw that it's going to be beautiful through Tuesday night. Wednesday, it's going to be a downpour. So the Lord just knew, you know, hey, Truth Baptist is having their family revival. We've got to keep that nice weather. And uh, but I'm so glad that you're here. It's a blessing for us to have Pastor Mike Edwards with us, my pastor growing up, still my pastor now, and what a wonderful connection class hour we already had, and uh, went through Ephesians 5, and just so very helpful, biblical, but also practical for all of us. And uh, I've been helped already, and I know that you will, both in this service as well as in tonight's service, in the next two Nights after that, Monday night and Tuesday night, uh, we are excited about what's ahead. I'm thankful for our homes, aren't you? I'm thankful that we can be in a marriage relationship and that we can uh, have husbands and wives and children. And what a blessing that is. And that's God's way. And when you do things God's way, you find that God honors that. And, you know, our churches will only be as strong as our homes. And we want strong homes and uh, what a blessing it is. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes investment. It takes really the commitment of our lives. Uh, but in the end, there's a great blessing and a reward to be had as well as throughout our lives. And uh, so I hope it'll be a help and a blessing to you. Um, we got a lot to look forward to and some things to talk about this morning. But let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this service. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. Lord, thank you for the folks who are here today. What a great morning we've already had, as well as yesterday. Lord, I was so encouraged to see so many here working out on the grounds, as well as cleaning inside the facility, as well as going out door to door. We've already had a, a very involved weekend. And now, Lord, it's great to see that many are committed to hearing from your word today. Be with preacher as he speaks to us. Lord, thank you for the message he's already brought. Empower him in the message to follow, as well as Lord, in tonight's service and the next two nights to follow, we'll trust you to speak directly to us through your word as you use God's man to minister it to us. Lord, we do pray for the souls of men. We pray that if there might be somebody here today who's never trusted in you as Lord and Savior of their life, we ask and pray, Lord, that they would make that all-important decision today and that they would look to you and turn to you and see their need for a Savior and trust in you once and for all and have their lives changed and their sins forgiven. But Lord, we look to you, we thank you and love you for who you are and what you mean to us. May your Holy Spirit lead, guide, and direct. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to have our ushers come forward briefly if they would. And if you're here visiting for the very first time today, we want to welcome you to our service. It's a blessing to have you here with us. And if you are visiting for the first time, our ushers have something they want to give to you. Just slip your hand up as they come down, and we want to give this to you. Uh, a booklet, a pen, a visitor welcome card, and we just want to let you know we're thankful that you're here. My wife and I will be in the lobby after the service, and we hope we get a chance to talk with you a little further and learn a little bit about you. Uh, this is... Uh, a special time for us because we are hosting our guest preacher today, uh, Mike Edwards. His wife Nancy is back home in North Carolina, still recovering from knee replacement surgery. We miss her, uh, but we'll take him, I guess, without her. And uh, But we're glad uh, that he could be with us. And we're really focusing, like we said, on the home, but really on God's word just to speak to our hearts. Uh, I look at this as an intensive time for us to study and learn what God wants for us uh, in our homes and in our personal lives as we walk with him. But there are several things just practically I want to help us to remember. Uh, first of all, today uh, we are having our normal services, but tonight we're going to move that 6 o'clock service up to 5 o'clock, okay? I'd say, why are we doing that? Well, because we're going to have a fellowship at 6, and whenever we have those evening fellowships, we like to kind of get a jump on things. And so come back tonight. We want you here. 
but just try to make that mental note, if you would, that we're moving the evening service time up to five. That gives everybody kind of a, an hour to be ahead of the schedule a little bit, and uh, it allows us to have dinner right at six as opposed to seven. It'll be a simple fellowship. Bring sandwiches, desserts, some kind of uh, something to share if you can, and uh, we will all enjoy that together at the conclusion of the evening service right at six o'clock, and then we'll clean everything up and go home and look forward to two more nights of being together. So remember that. In order to do that, we need some men right after the service to go downstairs, and uh, if those men can help just set up some tables and chairs and that sort of thing. But I also need just to have about a brief five-minute meeting about five minutes after the service for all those who are involved in helping to take care of the grounds and uh, the grass and making sure that we keep everything cut. It, we're in the season now. We're really starting this week. We're going to have to cut the grass every week. And we have a team that commits to volunteering to do that uh, really from now all the way through the end of October, early November. Joe Oaks, go like that, Joe, if you would. He's our guy in charge of that, all right? But uh, he's going to be here and and he's going to be a part of that meeting. We'd love you to be a part of that if you were a part of it last year. We had about six or seven different teams or individuals, and so that really just you only had to do it once every six or seven weeks. Maybe you didn't get to be a part of that last year, but you'd like to let us know that, okay, and uh, just come to the meeting, and we can put you on that schedule. We're going to get the schedule together, and we'll look forward to that and be prayerful about it, and uh, it's a great way to serve. Some people say, Pastor, I can never get up and sing a special, but I can cut grass. Well, that's a great way to serve. We had a whole bunch of people out here laying down mulch and putting in plants. And uh, Brother Connor, where are you? there he is way back there. I gave him more than he could handle, but a lot of people came and helped him, so it wasn't all on him. And so thank you to all those who came and helped and served. Uh, it was a great blessing. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would. Remember the next two nights, Monday night and Tuesday night, and uh, be here for those services as well. Now, Preacher is no longer a pastor. He's a pastor emeritus, but now he also is an evangelist. And uh, here's how his needs are met. The churches he goes to, they fulfill the need. And they give to that need, and they give to uh, giving a love offering to him. So we're going to do that. However, we're going to do that after he preaches, okay? And so this Right now, this offering is our regular tithes and offerings, and then after preacher preaches, uh, we'll have another offering, and we'll collect that offering as the love offering. We'll do that again tonight, and then all of Monday night and Tuesday night's offerings will also go towards that. And uh, maybe that's new for you. Maybe you're new to our church and say, how does this work? Well, again, this is the normal offering and tithes. But then we ask, Lord, how can I help the man of God who's here? How can I meet his need? What amount would you want me to give uh, to be a blessing and an encouragement? Preacher didn't come asking for a cent. He didn't come saying that you have to give me this for me to be here. Uh, he just said, I'll come and preach and be a blessing. Never asked for anything, but we want to meet his needs. So keep that in mind today, tonight, as well as the next two nights, Monday night and Tuesday night. But at this time, we'll collect the regular tithes and offerings. Brother John Ty, would you pray for that, please?
Hey, Amen. Isn't, isn't God's grace good? It is. Let's stand together and let's take our hymnals and let's sing now with the choir. If you will, please take your hymnal and turn to 454. It's a short chorus. We'll sing through it twice this morning. One that we've sang in the past, maybe new to some of us. Come and fill our homes with your presence. This is the family prayer song. And so let's sing it that way as a prayer to the Lord, asking the Lord to join our home and lead. Come and fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve. Let's sing it once more. Come and fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. serve the Lord. And if you have a bulletin this morning, would you please take it out? We'll sing our chorus. Jesus is Lord of everything. It's on the back of your bulletin on the right side. Let's all sing it together. Jesus is Lord of everything. A creator, redeemer, he is the king. He left his throne on high, crowned with thorns to die. He conquered death and rose again. Oh, someday he's coming in power to reign. All nations will honor him then. Lift up your voice and sing that Jesus is the King. Oh, he is the Lord of everything. King of everything. Yes, Jesus is Lord of everything. Greet those around you this morning. Junior church children, you can be dismissed as well.
All right, as we make our way back to our seats, grab your bulletin. We're going to sing this one more time. Jesus is Lord of everything, creator, redeemer, he is the king. He left his throne on high, was crowned with thorns to die. He conquered death and rose again. Someday he's coming in power to reign. All nations will honor him then. Lift up your voice and sing that Jesus is the King. Oh, He is the Lord of everything. Oh, He is the Lord and King of everything. Yes, Jesus is Lord of everything. Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, it's been a blessing already. Uh, to be here this morning and to have the great connection class hour that we did and it, it's special for me to be able to have uh, pastor mike edwards here as you know he's my pastor he's been here with us before and uh, not only is he a pastor but he's also a husband he's also a dad and so he knows what that's like and he has experience with those things and understands what it means to be a husband and to raise a home and to uh, raise a family. And uh, some of our ushers can get those doors. Thank you, guys. Uh, but anyway, he knows full well what it's all about. And I, we were just talking yesterday evening. We had some coffee, and uh, I, I remember a time. He might not remember it, but I stayed at his house for a week, and his son Josh is just a year younger than me. And we were talking about how I, I, I remembered specifically that week I stayed there. Josh wanted to show me all the... Uh, the trails out in the woods, and uh, I said my dad might show him some trails he's made out in the woods this week, but I can remember playing manhunt with his son Josh, not with flashlights, but with BB guns out in his backyard, and so, you know, raised boys and grew up, you know, just like normal families. You know, you know what you understand, you have to understand this about pastors and preachers is we're normal people, and we have normal, you know, issues and problems, and you know, we, we, we're not mythical people. We're just people like you, you and everyone else. We're flesh and blood, but we're striving to do God's will, and we're striving to follow his calling. And uh, what I appreciate about Preacher is that that's, he's just real, and uh, he's going to have a lot from God's word to help us with, but he has wisdom and experience that only 70 years can give you. And so I want you to listen. I know that you will. He's been an encouragement and a blessing, and I trust he'll help us this week. Thank you so much. Thanks, yep. Appreciate it. I remember that weekend we had three windows with BB holes in it, and I, I wondered where that had come from, now I know, and uh, I still have a receipt, so I'll be sending that to you. Um, woods, boys and woods, amen, and uh, I'm so thankful that uh, a good portion of the time we had our boys in our home, we lived where there was a woods and a creek and a lake and they could really enjoy it. So, and I, uh, I know I still enjoy it. However, at my age, I'm not as nimble to get around it as I once was. It's just an honor to be here, and I, I truly appreciate your being here this morning. I know you're not here for me. I know you're here because you love the Lord. But I want you to know that I want to and have asked the Lord to enable me to bring something to you that will be an encouragement to you, but also maybe challenge each and every one of us in our hearts. Uh, if you'll come back tonight and tomorrow night and Tuesday night, I make you this promise. I know that you have busy schedules. I know that you have children that have busy schedules, and I will not um, abuse your time. And uh, I will be prepared and prayerfully give you something that the Lord can use in your life and in your home. So I trust that you'll be back and uh, let the Lord be open to what the Lord can do through this meeting. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd ask you to turn this morning to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And I want to preach to you on this thought for a few moments this morning. The greatest problem in every marriage. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, you don't know me and you don't know my home. 
I don't need to know any specifics about your home. I, I think the Bible identifies for us the greatest problem that each and every one of us have, and we bring it from our lives into our homes. I hope that I can expose that to you this morning. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity this morning. Thank you for these people and their willingness to hear the word. And I pray that you would use this time in our lives. Lord, there may be those here this morning that have never trusted Christ as their Savior. And I pray that they would see their need and then also your great love for them. And I pray that you'd speak to them about their need of Christ. For all of us that are here, I pray there's a great lesson and a great truth in here about our hearts and how they apply to our marriages and our homes. So teach us from that. Convict us and encourage us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, does he know it's a family conference? Does he know that we're supposed to be preaching on the home? And yes, I do. And though this is an unusual text, I think by the time we're done, you'll see why I've chosen this and I think why the Lord has led. I've spent the last 50 years of my life as a married man. Uh, February 25th for my wife and I was our 50th anniversary. And uh, my prayer is, is that she keeps me at least another year, all right? 47 of those years I have preached in some capacity or another. Um, most of those years reading and studying the Bible, trying to uh, be everything that the Bible wanted me to be in my home. And, and then also because of pastoring, counseling, and trying to encourage people in their homes. I used to think at some point that I would come to the place where I had heard everything, where in my counseling, yep, I, I know that, I can put that in this class or that class, because at some point you have to exhaust all the ways men can be stupid, right? And then one day I realized, you know what, our problems in our life and our problems in our homes are rarely a product of our circumstances. They are mostly a product of our heart. And really, we can devise new ways that we can mess things up. We can devise new ways that we can go in a wrong direction. And it's not very flattering, but I want you to remember something at the beginning of this message and remind yourself all through this message of a great truth that is very unflattering to us. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The next verse, he answers that question, the Lord tries the rain. The Lord can know our hearts. And one of the great helps that he give us, gives us is the Holy Spirit to reveal our own hearts to us. It occurred to me that sometimes in a marriage, we treat each other like people treat the Lord. For the sake of time, I don't want you to turn to this verse, but I want to read a verse from Ezekiel to you. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Ezekiel is saying, I've noticed something about your people, Lord, that they will assemble themselves and they'll come before you at times of worship. They'll come before you at times of ceremony and they will say the words. They'll say the right words at the right times in the right places. But I've noticed something about them, Lord, that time exposes even though they say the right words, they pursue their own way. 
They're really about their own covetousness, he says. It's, it's really about giving you assent. Yes, we'll say the words, but, but I'm going to go my own way. I don't mean to be overly harsh this morning, but many times that's what I see in marriages. There are times when words of love are expressed and when we do the right thing and give the gift at the right time. And yet, over a period of time, it's revealed that our hearts are not exactly where our words are. And so many times we can be living under the same roof and raising the children together and doing things that husbands and wives do together and yet pursuing our own way. It reminds me of a letter that Ann Landers wrote one time. Now, I realize that my age, I have to explain who Ann Landers was because this world doesn't know. And uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, Ann Landers was a syndicated columnist. She was an advice columnist, and people would write into Ann Landers and ask her questions, and from her great fount of wisdom, she would give them answers. And then one day she wrote this letter. It was titled, Anne Has No Answer. Quote, The sad, incredible fact is that after 36 years of marriage, Jules and I are being divorced. As I write these words, it's as if I'm referring to a letter from a reader that we are going our separate ways is one of life's ironies. How did it happen that something so good for so long did not last forever? The lady with all the answers does not know the answer to this one. And perhaps there's a lesson there for all of us, at least there is for me. Never say it could not happen to us. I think that's an important statement, but to be honest with you, the phrase that I bold emboldened in my notes was this. She said that we are going our separate ways is one of life's ironies. And I would say to you, Anne, for all the advice you've given, you're just blind as a bat. Because our default position as human beings is to go our own way to focus on our own way, to focus on our needs, to want it our way. It's not ironic. It is our default position. It is what we did with the Lord. It is why Jesus had to come and save us. That's why our iniquity had to be laid upon him. And if you're here this morning and you've never had that moment in your life where you acknowledge that is true, please understand that as lovingly as I can say it, we are all sinners. You are a sinner. And the only difference between you and I, trust me, I'm a sinner, but in February of 1975, I met Jesus. And Jesus took my sin. And instead of my sin, now I have his righteousness and when the father looks at me he no longer sees vile Mike Edwards he sees the righteousness of his son which I do not deserve not one day but by the grace and the mercy of God and that is available to you as well but from the beginning of time our default position is I'll go my way I'll go my way I'll go my way We are prone to wonder, the songwriter said, because we go our way. And here is the truth, and I want to get it across to you as clearly as I can. We come into a marriage with a default position. I want it my way. I want to go my way. I want to offer you two thoughts this morning. Here's number one. You and I must realize that marriage does not eliminate differences, it exposes them. Can I say it again? Marriage does not eliminate differences, it exposes them. When I was pastoring, I literally, literally married 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young couples. I know so many pastors that have a lot of funerals and a few marriages. I had a few funerals, but I just was a marrying preacher, I'm telling you. And these starry-eyed couples would come into my office, and I wanted to counsel them, and I'd sit them down, you know, and and uh, they'd come in with such unrealistic expectations. They would come in, counseling is what the old bald guy made them do. Because they had other stuff more important to do. They had cakes to order and dresses to try on and flowers to figure out. And that's what was really important. And I'd have to sit them down there and try to make them understand, hey, I know if we're not careful, we get lost in all of that stuff, and it's wonderful. I'm for it. But I want you to be sober. And I'd ask them this question. Why are you two getting married? Oh, we love each other. <laughs> and I'd always do this. I'd take my glasses off, and I'd say, I've never had anybody say that to me. I'd say back to him, every couple that's ever come in here has said, because we love each other. They would follow it up with, we're each other's best friends. I'd go home to my wife and I'd say, help me with this. Have there been days in our marriage where you have not felt friendly toward me? <laughs> now, I'm not making little of it, but I am suggesting this. One uh, author said it this way. She is convinced that she can change him. He is convinced that she will never change. And they embark on a journey of discovery <laughs> that they're both wrong. Sure, there are differences. There are things that will need to be worked out, they say, but we have a love that will overcome all of that. Here's the truth. In the early part of romance, we don't go our own way. When I was trying to win my wife, I had hair, and I really combed it well. <laughs> and when I was trying to win my wife, my, my wife, I don't mean to be silly, but she is, she is a very expressive person who likes for every detail to be understood by me. And so for her to tell me she put the chicken in the refrigerator is like a 10-minute journey, all right? Because I have to know how she picked the bowl up, and I have to know how she walked over to it and how she had to hold it. I mean, she just loves to be very descriptive, and that's fine. That's who she is. And I remember dating. We'd be on, I hate talking on the phone with a passion. And we would be talking on the phone, and, and I'd be going, yeah, uh-huh, great, wow. Fast forward 50 years, can you just say it and get it done? Now, preacher, do you have a point in that? Yes, I do. Our dating process and romantic love allow us to overlook differences. But familiarity in years of marriage expose and exasperate, exasperate those differences. If we're not careful, those differences begin to become very familiar and very aggravating. They can lead to avoidance. We avoid each other. We avoid about communicating about differences. Avoidance becomes resentment, and then resentment can become anger. And when the avoidance and the resentment and the anger set in, that's when there can be words of love and expressions of love but not truly the heart feeling that needs to be there. And slowly and subtly, people decide to turn everyone to his own way. You say, preacher, how, how do we fight that? What do we do? Because we are our own self, and, and because... He does do things that aggravate me, and she does do things that aggravate me. And, and, and boy, sometimes it just, you know, I, I'm committed. I'm not leaving, not, nothing like that. But just how do we get through that? And can I suggest to you, number two, since we have the hearts of sinners, 
you and I have to develop the mind and the heart of the Savior. Since we have the hearts of sinners, we have to develop the mind and the heart of the Savior. The antidote to the self-life is the Christ life. And every husband in this room needs to commit to the Lord, not to his wife, but commit to the Lord, I will lead the Christ life, not the self life. And every woman in this room has to commit to the Lord, not to her husband, to the Lord, I will lead the Christ life. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 for a few moments. Philippians chapter 2. And I know this is a very familiar passage, but I personally think it's one of the most critical passages for Christian living in the New Testament. And here's what God says. Look at verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, in any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, and let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. When I look to the Lord's life, I see that he refused to turn to his own way. Sometimes we read the Bible and we sanitize it. And I want us to recall and remember this morning that when Jesus was incarnate, when Jesus walked this earth, he still had the prerogative of God. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I mean that had he called for a legion of angels, had he wanted to come down off the cross, the Bible tells us that legions of angels would have been sent. He could have come down off that cross. I I would also suggest to you that uh, he wouldn't have had to call legions of angels. Had Had he wanted to come down off the cross, he could have simply come down off the cross. His entire life was spent in humble service to us and to the will of his Father. And you say, that's great, that's the gospel, that's what he was here to do. But can I remind you of what he experienced in that time? Can I remind you that he experienced the rejection of his own? He came unto his own, but his own received him not. He had every expectation that he would be received, that he would be accepted, that he would be loved by the Israelites, the Jew, the Hebrew. And yet when he came unto his own, we see that final scene. Oh, the, when he triumphantly enters Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. And they throw palm fronds down on his path. And seven days later, they stand at the gate of Pilate and shout, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and our children. I want to tell you, that's rejection. Here to love and here to die for them and and to experience that rejection, can I remind you that he was denied by those who were closest to him? We see the night of his passion. He takes a towel and a basin and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Do you know whose feet he was washing? He was washing the feet of the disciples who would all forsake him and flee. Sometimes we concentrate on Peter and Judas, but do not forget every disciple forsook him and fled. Move down that line and he comes to Peter's feet. The one who had boasted, though all should forsake you, not not me. Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he washes 
the denier's feet. Well, I'll tell you this, preacher. I'm not washing nobody's feet. I demand to be respected. I demand that, that, that people see me and, and receive me. And Jesus said, well, here's how I live. I'll wash the feet of a denier. And he moves a little further down and he washes the feet of one who just a few hours ago sold him for 30 pieces of silver who will approach him in the garden that night and with an outward gesture of love, kiss him on the cheek and it'll be the sign to arrest him and take him away. Oh, there's the picture of outward acceptance, but the heart is far from it. And Jesus experiencing rejection and experiencing denial and experiencing betrayal, washes their feet. He comes to that place in the garden where he looks into the cup of our sin, and there he is God. He is perfect in everything. They sought and looked, and they could not convince him of sin. They couldn't find anything that he had done wrong. Yet he is going to take our sin upon him. And as he takes our sin upon him, the Father will forsake him. Hey, it's one thing to be forsaken by disciples and denied by Peter and rejected by your people and betrayed by Judas. But when your Father forsakes you, boy, in my human mind, Jesus would have been, uh, it would have been acceptable for him to stand up and say, no, it's not right, it's not fair, it wasn't my expectation. But instead, he emptied himself, became a servant, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You say, preacher, I'm not Jesus. No, we're not. But we are commanded to have the mind of Christ. And it is a project for our lifetime after knowing him as our Savior, to know him and become like him. And there ought to be a passionate pursuit in every husband's heart, in every wife's heart, to develop a Christ-like mind with a Christ-like heart, to not look upon our own things. I have needs, preacher, and he's not meeting them. I have expectations, preacher, and they're not being met. She's not meeting them. I know. And with no sense of glee, the correct answer is stop looking on your own things. Hard to receive, isn't it? Esteem them better than yourself. Refuse to do things through haughtiness. Now, every time when I preach this message, I'll have a person say to me, well, I guess you want people to stay in an abusive relationship, not one second. If you are being physically abused, leave. But I am saying this, that sometimes our feelings get hurt and sometimes legitimate expectations do not get met and we do not feel loved, and God says, stop looking on your needs. You say, well, preacher, I I just don't know that I'm able to do that. The life of a believer in a marriage is to constantly fight the force of self and surrender to the spirit of humility and service. 
We must be intentional. We must be purposeful. You say, well, you're acting like everybody's marriage is really bad. No, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that everybody's marriage in this room can be better. I'm saying that. And I'm saying that you've got to be intentional in your life to not go to the default position of self. Not go to the default position of me. Because when you took those vows, you took vows like for better or worse. You took vows where you intended to become one flesh with that person. And if you're going to be one flesh with another person, that means you've got to set yourself aside a whole lot. You say, well, you just want us to be miserable. You, you just, this is horrible. Can I remind you of verse 9 in this chapter? Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. You see, sometimes we, we finish the sermon before God does. And yes, I have talked about rejection and denial and disappointment and and, and rejection and being forsaken. And, and that is our lot sometimes. But when we respond the way that God wants us to respond, when we respond with humility, humbling ourselves, emptying ourselves, then God is allowed to work. And God's result was Jesus was not left forsaken. Jesus was not left rejected. I don't mean to make this, I don't mean to sound silly. Jesus wasn't rejected that afternoon in February of 1975 when Mike Edwards had the gospel presented to him. And I bowed my knee before him and I said, God, if you can save somebody like me, would you save me? I'm just saying God can do what you and I cannot do if we will humbly submit ourselves to do it his way. You say, well, preacher, I'm just not perfect. I, I, I could never do that. You see, the mystery of a good marriage is not just having favorable circumstances. The mystery of a great marriage is in the humbling of our hearts. There are no easy marriages, but there can be mind of Christ marriages. I'll never forget one day, I was, had just counseled a couple, and, and I was heartbroken for them. I mean, I was heartbroken for them. They, they had just let anger grow. She, she literally, and, and I'm, not, I'm not condemning her. She kicked him in my office, and he needed care. And it built up for years and years. And, and he said to me, I... I want it to be right. I just, I don't see how it can be different. I don't see how we can get back there. As I was driving, well, my wife was at the church, and we left, and she had to go to the grocery store. I don't go to the grocery store. And so I sat outside in the car, and, and as I was sitting outside in the car, I was observing them building a building next to it. And it was the most massive brick wall I had ever seen in my life. And I had watched it when I drove past going from home to church and saw the progress they were making. And while she was in there, I just observed about five bricklayers. And I observed what they did. This is earth shattering. Stay with me. They took one brick at a time and put it on the wall. See, I told you it was earth shattering. The brick wall did not come preassembled. They put one brick at a time, and they built a massive brick wall. And it occurred to me, how do marriages get better? How do marriages get past the walls that we bring or build? Well, you take one brick at a time off. Sometimes what we want is for the fairy tale to be real today. I want it all today. I want it fixed today. And the truth is, it doesn't happen that way. And what I would suggest to all of us, our marriages aren't falling apart. I'm not intimating that. But I'm saying that every marriage could get better. 
every relationship could get stronger. Every couple could feel closer. And let me tell you the way to it. Put you aside and esteem them better than self. And a brick at a time, every time you are tempted to say that thing that you know is the trigger, refuse to say it. Every time that you want to remind that person, well, you didn't, don't say it. Every time you want to assert yourself in a way that you know will escalate the art, don't do it. Every time that you need to apologize, do it. Every time that you need to acknowledge you're wrong, do it. You say, I won't do it perfectly. Do it every time you can. And one brick at a time, we take walls down. You say, preacher, can you sum this up? Yeah, I can. Our default position is me. Our default position is my way, my way, my way, my way. And when two people live in a house, maybe one insisting on their way and one kind of being pushed in that, I'm just telling you, over time, avoidance grows and resentment grows and anger grows. And we still say the words we're supposed to say. We still give the gifts we're supposed to give. But there's just a wall there. And the only way for that wall to come down, the only way for it to be rich in what it should be, is when we decide I'm not going to do the default position of self. I'm going to humble myself. Don't you love doing that? Don't you just love humbling yourself? No, it doesn't come naturally to us. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to empty myself. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, see my needs. I'm going to see their needs. I, I, I'm going to esteem their needs better than mine. I'm going to meet their needs if mine never get met. I'm going to put it first and I'm going to do it that way. And in an amazing transaction, God comes around and exalts that humble servant. You see, God resists the proud. Oh, but does he love that humble husband, that humble wife who puts the other first? What is our greatest problem in life? Me. Self. And the antidote to the self-life in our business, in our church life, in our home life, is the Christ life. You can apply that principle to any facet of your life. Put others first, you second. Esteem others better than yourself. Not looking upon your things, your means, your needs, looking on theirs. Saying, Christ, will you use me to bless them? And he circles around and exalts you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for these few moments you've given us, and we thank you for your word, the blessing that it is to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see this simple truth. It's not an easy thing to do, to humble ourselves, to empty ourselves, but it is the needed thing to do. We think of how we won our wives, or how we got married, and we got married by meeting the needs of the other. We won them. And then somehow we default to that old position. Oh, I know that these homes are good homes and these are good marriages, but in every home, if we're not careful, selfishness creeps in. Exalting self. Expecting our needs to be met. 
It can cause avoidance, resentment, anger, and build walls. So I pray this morning in any way and every way that you would speak to husbands and wives, parents and children, and help them to purpose in their life that they will live the servant's life, the Christ life, even when they've been hurt, even when their need wasn't met, even when their opinion wasn't respected. They will lead the servant's life and let you exalt them. Father, I pray for unsaved people that they would see they've gone their own way, but that Christ can save them today. Would you meet the needs in our congregation, I pray. Just before I conclude, I wonder if there might be one or two husbands, wives. Hey, maybe it's in another area of your life that you would say, you know, I've gotten a little selfish on this thing. And God, you touched my heart about it. And just by an uplifted hand, I'm just acknowledging, I heard what you said to me, and I'm going to correct that in my relationship. And by an uplifted hand, you just say, Preacher, I'm just acknowledging I heard what God said to me. I've gotten a little bit self-oriented in that, and I'm asking God to help me deal with it. Would you lift your hand just where I can see it? God bless you. Many, many hands. It's, it's our default position. I do it. My hand's up. And God, I'm just saying, I'm asking you to help me with it. I wonder if there might be one here today that would say, Preacher, here's the truth. I don't know Christ as my Savior. Never been a time in my life where I've been confronted with what you said today, that I'm a sinner, but that Christ took my sin on himself at the cross. And my friend, he did it because he loves you, took your place, and he can give you his righteousness in a transaction for your sin. And preacher, I'd like to know him as my Savior. I don't know that I do. I'd like to. Can I pray for you? Would you lift your hand? I don't know that I know Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to. Now, Father, look at our hearts. Thank you for your love for us. I pray that you would help us to see truth. And Lord, maybe we need a trip to the altar. Maybe we need to just get things and say the truth to you and just not worry about what people think, but just say, God, I heard you, and I want to take care of that in my life. I want my wife to be loved. I want my husband to know I love him, and I don't want it to just be words. And Lord, I, I, we built a little wall, and I want to take that wall down. I want it to start today. God, I want you to work. Some of you need to pray for a spouse. Whatever the need is, if God's spoken to your heart in just a moment, you come. Would you stand with me? As the piano plays, we'll just play softly. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If God's spoken to you, why don't you take a step out and come to the altar, would you? God, I'm just telling you, giving it to you. I want your help. I want you to to assist me to take the walls down. Would you come? whatever the need may be. Maybe you need to pray for your children. Maybe you need to pray for a friend, a couple. Maybe you need to pray for your own home and you just say, we need, we just need help. We just want to acknowledge it. God, would you help us this morning? We want the walls to come down. Others are coming. You can pray at your seat. But God, Do business with God, please.
think I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop uh, being up there when people join because you feel like you're on the chopping block while the pastor's up there looking down on you, saying, "Let's see if they're worthy," you know. And uh, so I'm going to start being on the ground level with them as people join. But we have two different couples today uh, wanting to join in membership. We have Roger and Patsy Edwards, and uh, they've been coming for some time now. And we have John and Karen Woodward. And uh, let me say something about each of them. First of all, uh, the Edwards have been coming really since last summer and have been a blessing and uh, have jumped in, have served. Roger was here yesterday putting down mulch. When you're getting dirty and putting down mulch, you know that you're serving the Lord. Amen. And, uh, and then Patsy has been a blessing and said, hey, can I, I love it when ladies say, can you please put me in the nursery? When you hear that, you know you got a servant, amen. And because uh, you don't, I don't, we don't hear that very often. But that's what she did. She came and said, "Can I please be put in a nursery?" And we said, "Let us think about that." Yes, right now we'll put you in there. And uh, so anyway, uh, she's had that heart. And uh, Patsy does hair in her home too. That's a little side note. And uh, have been a blessing. I think she's done some of your hair already, ladies. And uh, but anyway, the Edwards come desiring membership here in our church. Both have been saved and scripturally baptized. And the Woodwards, they're old friends. We know them. And uh, they have been members at our church before. John, uh, because of work, uh, they've moved uh, to the other side of town. And here just recently, they believe the Lord has reunited themselves with us and desired membership back here uh, at our church uh, in good standing. And uh, they have obviously been both saved uh, and scripturally baptized. And uh, I am thrilled to have the Woodwards back with us. Uh, it's an encouragement. Uh, I, it must have been probably just a few years into when we started that you all were with us the first time. Uh, their children have been raised in our church, in our youth group, and now two of his daughters are here sitting there. And uh, that, that's a blessing. It's, that's a generational blessing. Uh, Gabe, he's down a part of Calvary Baptist in Smithfield. And uh, of, of all the young people that have come up in our church, he probably calls me the most. And he just called me yesterday, as a matter of fact, and just wanted to chat. And uh, I love that about their family and about them. They're an encouragement and a blessing as well. Uh, we can do this all together. I would like to get a motion that we accept both the Woodwards and the Edwards into our membership. All right, Chick Bertram raises his hand. Tom Hastings, second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Give a good hearty amen. Uh, any opposed? And there are none. Praise the Lord. We love you all. Uh, you all can be seated and uh, in just a moment after we collect the love offering, I would like both of you couples to be out in the back in the lobby. And let's make a point of welcoming, welcoming both of these wonderful couples into our fellowship. Thank you. You all can be seated in your pews. I'm going to ask our ushers to come if they would. It's time for us to collect the love offering. And uh, let's give and let's give generously. And uh, like I said, we're going we're gonna to collect the love offering again tonight. You might say, do I give each and every time? Really, you can give one time. Pick your time to do it. But now is a good time to do it right after the morning service. And uh, we hope that we can all give. Uh, we all want to be a part of the blessing of giving generously to the man of God who comes to minister to our needs. And you know us here at Truth Baptist Church. We don't hit giving and giving and giving because we just believe God's people should give and that's the right thing to do and you understand that and you understand giving to God's servants as they come and meeting the need that they have as they come to minister to our need and what a powerful message that was amen wasn't that a blessing what a blessing and uh, you know if, if we will just get the heart of Christ our homes will be helped that's all I'll say because preachers like to go preach second and third messages and everything else but that was powerful. Thank you, preacher. Thank you for being here with us. But we're going to collect uh, the love offering now. And uh, Brother Richard Johnson, would you pray for that offering, please?
Thank you, Holly. You've been busy at the piano this morning, and uh, you've been a blessing this morning like you have been every Sunday. Thank you for that. It's been an encouragement. We have several things to do before we go, and uh, remember two things. We need some men to go downstairs, and we need some tables and chairs set up for this evening, okay? Uh, I would prefer that those men not be the same men that need to meet up here for the grounds maintenance crew meeting, okay? So different men who uh, can set up tables than the ones that will be meeting here in just about five minutes. We'll just meet in these two rows, all the ones who will be a part of the grounds and maintenance crew with Brother Oaks and myself. And uh, really, if we can just get that help down there, uh, help Margaret get everything set up, she'll really appreciate that. What time are we going to get here tonight? Five. Five. All right. All right. Five o'clock. And then stay after at six. Bring something. Bring something. Some people excuse themselves and they say, I couldn't bring anything, so I didn't come. You don't get an excuse for that, okay? If you, couldn't, if you can't bring something, we still want you to come. The important thing is being here. Be here for the 5 o'clock service. And look, let's remain after and have some fellowship at 6. It won't be long. Just a quick time to fellowship. We'll go on our way. And we'll really look forward to both Monday night and Tuesday night. Let's all stand together. Let's be dismissed now in a word of prayer. Brother Greg Perisher, would you dismiss us, please? Welcome the Woodwards and the Edwards into our membership. Grounds crew will meet up here in five minutes.